Okay, Movember, day 14. For this tool tonight, I want to just quickly go through the tools for objectification when you were treating sex, love, or avoidance addiction. So early on in recovery, when we are out and about or just in fantasy, we can get triggered just exercising, going for a walk, going to the beach, shopping. Um, you can get triggered by that visual stimulation. And so this could be ads on TV, news presenters, it could be people out in public, it could be someone exercising in your local park. Each person's arousal template is different, therefore what's going to trigger somebody at this point is going to be very personal. But what's important is that we identify it so we can tell someone so we know what to look out for. The note here though is that the goal of recovery is healthy sexuality. Uh, in the work of Sheila Gregory in The Great Sex Rescue, she really does challenge the purity culture and and the message that men have got to look away and not look. And and so we're, this is not a message where we can't look at women or women can't look at men. This is that if you suffer from a sex and love addiction, and part of that in the cycle of addiction is that you go into fantasy and euphoric recall, then sometimes visual, stim visual stimulation might need to uh, be just put on hold for a while. We need to turn away. Eventually our goal is, is to drink in the beauty of the world. But in early recovery there'll be some restrain, some retrain, and then we can sort of re-emerge in a healthier frame of mind with these images not triggering impaired thinking and fantasy in our addiction. So let me take you through some of these. And again, you might find some of these are triggering them in themselves. So it is a bunch of tools that you take what you need and leave the rest. So here's a few. First one, three second rule. Now this isn't one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, then turn away. This is, if something's gonna be triggering for you, really we need to stop, look away and pray or affirm depending on what your spiritual belief is. If you're a, a spiritual person, you might pray directly to God, say the serenity prayer. If you're an atheist or agnostic, you might uh, choose an affirmation that works for you. But the three seconds is, the you know, the first looks on God or creation, you know, the, the second looks, I'm sorry, the first looks on, on God, the second looks on us. So we're really just trying to interrupt that, what we might have once done, um, just even unconsciously, we're interrupting it with a three-second rule. Stop, look away, pray or affirm. The next one is eye bouncing. So uh, the fellow once that used to have to walk through the business district, his arousal template was turned on by power dressing women, pencil skirts, high heels, uh, uh, professionally dressed women. So he had to really practice eye bouncing walking to work. So not fixating, which an addict, when they're really unconscious, can fixate on something and sort of tunnel vision it. And we, we need to practice that gently bouncing our eyes and, and consciously taking in other things that aren't triggering our addiction. The next one is humanizing. Now, again, if this is part of your fantasy arousal, this is one you wouldn't use. But it, if it isn't, and you're trying to tune into looking at women not objectively, which is the main danger, I think, of porn is, is the propaganda of how it gets you to look at women or women how you meant to look at men. Um, here it's about humanizing. So this is someone's wife. This is someone's daughter, someone's mother. This is a child of God. I usually try and get fathers to imagine if this was your, your daughter, how would you like other people to treat her and, and look at her and, and look with you know respect and dignity and, not, and lust in their eyes? So if humanizing works and that can really pull you down into an integritous moment, that's a good tool to have. Fantasy or image contamination. So once upon a time where we would look at someone and get really excited about it, this is about pairing it with, with a displeasing image. And there, there could be, um, uh, it could be helpful in this to play the tape forward. So part of that displeasure is, is, is we know that insanity is repeating the same mistakes, expecting a different result. So play this tape forward and focus on the consequences and not this fantasy, this insane fantasy that is going to play out in some same uh, some sort of new way and it's going to be okay and generally addicts will fantasize about something and they think they can control it that's our fantasy where for us one of the criteria of addiction is there's impaired control walk away sometimes just get out of there if you're in a place and it doesn't work for you or if at one end of the beach and it's too risque if you're on a walk and it's not walking leave get out move where you are and for people that have you know pray or affirm but you know 
This is where you might pray for some protection, some guidance, some realignment, or some affirmations that I'm a man in recovery or a woman in recovery, and this isn't what I do anymore. And, and at this point, too, you might use those recovery tools of outreach when you walk away or you know, call your sponsor to, to just tune in and tell somebody what's happening for you. Distraction techniques. So if you're in a place where you can't get out of it, it might be that you're at a workshop. I had a guy once that that called me and said he, he, he also found uh, professional women triggering and he was at a workshop all day and the, the presenter had met his arousal template. So he, he really changed his seat, which is one of the ones coming up, and he would use a stress ball all day just to, to focus on that, that in his fingers uh, so he wasn't wouldn't go into fantasy. So stress balls, uh, 10 push-ups, go for a walk, Wim Hof breathing, anything that really interrupts that moment distracts you at that time. Choosing sitting wisely. It's amazing how many addicts have had to really consciously put this back on manual and take it off autopilot um, and seat facing their partner so they uh, can engage and talk and not uh, people watch and, and, and face out and about. This can be harder sometimes for men because it can be a bit of a safety and sort of a primal urge to be able to see where you can see things coming. Um, so you have to maybe negotiate that or, or me, you know measure your, your safety needs against um, this this sort of option. But if you've got a betrayed spouse, you've done a disclosure, and they know that the objectification of fantasy was one for you, then you might need to really take this one seriously. And you can always get up and move. I've seen guys in 12-step meetings have to get up and move because a female or someone had sat across from them or right next to them. And so, so choosing seating wisely is, you know, nothing gets in front of your recovery. So if you need to move, move. Those that matter don't mind. Those that mind don't matter. Just allow that one to play out. It's more important to keep your recovery. Engage in a personal connection if that is appropriate. Uh, in the workshop Alexandra Katahakis did on the weekend, she just made that wonderful point that, that recovery is about association, associating ourselves, uh, and, and addiction is about disassociation. So this one fits under that category. But if intrigue is one of your bottom lines, you mightn't choose this one because it it could um, be triggering. However, even if you in, intrigue was, if you engaged in a personal connection with somebody, if you uh, had to have some sort of small talk, you might, this is where you declare, look, I'm um, married or this, I'm in a relationship or I'm not, I'm not interested, you know, and we might talk about other things, but we don't go into those intrigue scripts. It will be talking about the stuff that we are into or what we're doing. Um, and the personal connection too is to get a sense of their humanness. You know, porn objectifies things, literally makes them a one-dimensional image where, where, where what this personal connection can do is, is, is bring us back to this is a daughter or this is a son, this is a, you know, a child of God, not somebody for me to use in my addiction. Avoidance techniques, mo is a, it's a momentary intervention, but counting backwards, alphabets, song lyrics, you know, if you're in a situation where you, you just need to distract yourself, take yourself into some sort of mind puzzle that can just, uh, you know, put, put your attention away from whatever's uh, triggering you into counting from 100 backwards or, you know, one of those sort of mind games that you can play singing your favorite song, remembering all the lyrics in your head as a way of just getting through the moment. But like it says, it is a momentary intervention, that one. An age-old 12-step adage is avoiding people, places, and things. So if you've got things that are triggering, I had an alcoholic once that used to have the, this favorite tumbler for his whiskey kept in the freezer. And one of our interventions was taking it out of the freezer and throwing it in the bin, buying new glasses, because the way it sat in his hand used to give him new fright recall. So avoiding people, places, and things. And again, this is for a while. This is for a while. It mightn't be for a lifetime. I knew one fellow once that avoided a certain beach area in a certain shopping center um, for just for a season. It was for the first year recovery because it was just too triggering. And so to get a little bit of time up and sobriety under his belt and some confidence that he could say no and some confidence in dealing with objectification, it, 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 it again is part of the restraint at the beginning of recovery while we're retraining. Acknowledge and talk about the fantasy with trusted people as soon as possible. I, I, th I think this is just one of the diamonds of recovery advice. Addicts just keep secrets and we mightn't have acted out, we mightn't have to declare we've had a relapse, but once a little fantasy brings up some euphoric recall or we've got an idea, we've got to expose that as much as we possibly can because it just 
that's that little bit of sand that turns into a pearl for an addict. And before you notice, we got a pearl necklace and it's, it's, it's too much for us to hold on to these fantasies. And they really do diminish and nearly dissolve when we can just out them to trusted people and just pull them apart and, and shut them down. It's a critical piece of advice to follow. Drive a different route. You know, there's there's certainly if you live on the beaches, you might want to drive that 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 track just in a little bit instead of along all of the the promenades where people are, are walking in their swimsuits or running or jogging in their active wear. Uh, you know, taking a different walking route from from work. Different, just these are different humbling techniques that help us to to go. You know what? Just for the time being or for a season, I'm gonna I'm gonna drive a different way. Or walk a different way, make my transit a different way because I'm just acknowledging that there's too many triggers on that other way. Holding ice in your hands, this is really good for people with unstructured time. They work alone, they walk, work solo in a, um, at home in a home office. Good one for people that, that are doing a lot of home office work. If you just can't break out of a fantasy or a troubling thought, put a block of ice in your hand and let it melt. Um, even if you've got to have a tea towel wrapped around it, but just get a create a somatic sensation that just sort of pulls you away from drifting into the trance that fantasy can bring up. Journal, but not about the fantasy. Journal about the reality and the consequences. This is the stuff that addicts don't do well. Patrick Kahn says that the most striking manifestation of addiction is an addict's ability to, to, to minimize use and consequences. So this is where we unminimize it. We really write about where does this particular thing take us and, and, and really think it through. Rubber band snap out of it. It's very old fashioned. And so for some people, it doesn't work. If you had a self-harm issue or a bondage and discipline issue, this might be one you would use. Again, it would be triggering. So you don't do it. But for other folks, it might be one of those things that just helps you. You know, if you catch yourself doing it, give you give yourself a little bit of a negative message. And again, if it works, work it. If it does not, please avoid that one. Mindfulness techniques, uh, focusing on your breath, awareness of body sensations and feelings, slow down. One of the things Alexandra said in the weekend, again, was uh, this, this idea of learning. Addicts have to learn to tolerate feeling states. We don't do it well. And we, and we don't know where it sits in our body. We don't, we're not used to tuning in. We tune out. We disassociate instead of associates. This mindfulness is is bring our our focus and awareness into our body, slow things down, get grounded, take your shoes off, put your feet on the carpet, feel the, the texture, have a glass of water, tune in and, 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 and start to work on tolerating and regulating your state in that moment. For people that are, are, are Christians, this is where you would pray. Um, the serenity prayers are a good one. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot, cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It is all in there. Um, so, you know, pray, pray the prayers and read scripture around how God sees you. I know the work of Neil T. Anderson and Victory Over Darkness, the bondage breaker, renouncing the lies that we tell ourselves and, and announcing the truth in God is a, is a good one. And prayers for protection against spiritual warfare. I know for anyone watching this that's atheist or agnostic, agnostic that's going to sound a little kooky, but for people out of a spiritual belief, this is a time to sometimes remember, oh, that's right, pray for protection. Pray um, against whatever warfare or foul thing might be coming against us. We are at war. For uh, atheists and agnostics, yeah, that other stuff, let it go. That's not for you. This is for you. Affirmations, the I am statements to self-affirm you and your recovery. This is when we have to tune in. Instead of those, oh, I can't help it, there's something wrong with me, I'm never going to get this, why not just act out, I'm such a loser, It's I'm still having these thoughts, that it's got to be doing it wrong. All of that negative inner critic self-talk, this is our chance to have that either thing, that Pia Melody gets people to tape uh, self-esteem affirmations on their phone and play it back to them. This is when you can tune into YouTube and play some iron statements um, it's about really tuning into who do I want to be now in my recovery, not 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 who am I in my addiction. Letter to self. So I thought I'd finish uh, this one with a letter to self. Uh, Patrick Patrick Carnes has a good uh, template for this in his um, 
facing the shadow work and the recovery starter kit, facing addiction books um, in most treatment centers, you're going to see this as an option. And it is a, a, a little come to Jesus or a moment of truth letter where if you're stumbling and, and, and sort of rummaging around in the addiction on the edge, and as Khan says in his anatomy of addiction, where we're in edging behaviors, then it's time to pull this out. So I'm going to finish this little video on the one that I've written for myself. Um, uh, that I have on my screen uh, saver on my computer and this will be personal but it's a great example. That's three my three sons crossing the bridge and so I wrote this to read to self when I need it. If you were reading this you were looking for inspiration for motivation to stay true to yourself true to your family I'm a Christian bloke if you're not a Christian bloke, you wouldn't have this spiritual stuff in here. You'd have the affirmation stuff in here. But I am. So this is mine. It's an example. So, you know, to stay true to yourself, to your family and true to God. The enemy is behind this addiction and his goal is to destroy you, your life, your family, your dreams. To seduce you into thinking that it either won't hurt or just doing it one more time does not matter or that everything is doomed anyway. So what's the point? If you are reading this, then you have asked me to remind you that you are at war, that's the addiction, and that God is your king, only God's will and the power, and, and God's will and power will lead you to salvation, that what I truly want in my heart of hearts is to be a good man, a good husband, a good father, a good son, and to God a good, a good king, a king that serves under a king. So I hope that's helpful. Your letter might be very, very, very personal to you. This is a personal letter to me. Always a risk to share something personal when you're a therapist because it's not going to hit for everyone else. But that speaks to me. The idea here is to have something for you that you can pull up on your phone, have on your computer, print it, put it in your diary, that, that if you're having a, a, a sort of an unclear moment or a confused moment or it's, you can feel the anatomy of a relapse just pulling you back in, then this is how you can find your true north again. So uh, I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Be gentle with your heart. And I hope this video has been helpful in your recovery.